So, it's been a few days since I saw Black Panther, and I've been wondering whether or not I should make a video about my thoughts on it, and ironically, I probably wouldn't have if uh, the movie hadn't have been doing so well and been so critically acclaimed. Um, I think I do have to quickly mention um, that this is a difficult movie to review, not necessarily because it's bad or good, but because... It is a very political movie. Um, I think there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of critics, especially that are going to be swayed uh, one way or another, more than likely the other, for it in a positive way because of what this movie kind of represents. Not so they're not going to be reviewing it based on its own merits, but on the idea of it, which I think is a real shame because. When it gets to that point, you're basically doing the opposite of what the creators and actors want for it. You're not giving it a positive review because it's a good movie. You're giving it a positive review because it's got a black cast, because it's about black culture, and you feel the need to give it a positive review because of the political landscape. I'm not saying everybody does it, but I do think it's a problem especially now it does seem like it's a bigger problem now than it was in the past like people are saying that this is a revolutionary movie uh, because it's got a black superhero in it because it's got a black cast because you know predominantly black cast and they're saying this like this hasn't been done before you know like there hasn't been black leads in movies before black superheroes or black heroes in general and there has you know this isn't a new thing Maybe there hasn't been as many as people might like, and I can totally understand that. But if you're going to review a movie like this because of its politics instead of the movie itself, then the only thing you're going to get is an, another era of black exploitation, where movies aren't made to be good movies, but made to capitalise on the fact that they have a black cast or because they're about black culture. That's the only thing that's going to happen if these movies are reviewed this way, which is surely the opposite of what these people want, I would have thought, but that's just my opinion. And again, I'm not saying everybody does it, but I do think this is a problem, especially among critics. I mean, if you look on a review site like Rotten Tomatoes, there seems to be a very ludicrously high score in favour of it on the critic side, but if you look on the audience side... It's very what I would consider, you know, typical of this movie, which is good, but not great, not bad. It's just a middle of the road Marvel superhero movie. And that's fine. Marvel movies in general are good movies. So if you've got a solid Marvel superhero movie, you're probably okay. I mean, there are a few stinkers out there, don't get me wrong, but this is easily in the better half of those movies. So if you want my, you know, if you want my review in five seconds is that it's a pretty good Marvel superhero movie, not great, not bad. Now, if you want my more detailed review of why I think it's only just good and not great, and I haven't, you know, pissed off everybody that's listening to this so far, then I will go into it and there will be spoilers. I will spoil the hell out of this movie because I feel like it needs to be spoiled in order to understand why I don't like it as much as other Marvel superhero movies. So this movie starts out either immediately after or not long after the events of Captain America Civil War when the previous king of Wakanda was assassinated and now his son uh, T'Challa has to return to Wakanda and become king. That's the basic setup of the first half of the movie. And... That can basically sum up the first 40 minutes of the movie is the introduction to Wakanda. And what kills me about uh, the introduction to the city of Wakanda is when they're on their way back, flying back in their spaceship, because the technological advancements of Wakanda are ridiculous. Uh, they pass through the the dome, um, a, a camouflaged dome that hides the city. And as they're flying through the cityscape, uh, there's, uh, <laughs> there's giant skyscrapers 
in the shape of tree houses or there's tree houses attached to like <laughs> the sides of buildings i mean i know that this is supposed to be african themed but the idea of attaching tree houses to the sides of buildings was a little on the nose i think they could have come up with something else in fact there's tons of stuff all throughout the city and the first 20 minutes that just make you kind of wonder why like the uh, city streets uh, aren't anything like the rest of the city the the majority of the city is like glass skyscrapers but the the city streets below are like all hard wearing and stone and cobble streets like a, almost like an african shanty town or or something and it's just really strange and there's lots of merchants and bartering going down and it's just really strange considering that this is supposed to be this technological utopia and yet there's intermingled technology and third world country-esque themes at the same time it's very strange and i get that that's probably what they were going for but it does take you out of the movie a little bit or at least it did to me uh, when you've got these very anachronistic settings and themes going on, it's just a very odd choice. Uh, but after that, uh, we're now in Wakanda, so now the focus shifts to T'Challa and his traditional ceremony to become king. And I actually thought this sequence was particularly hilarious because the whole scene... Um, takes place over the side of a waterfall. It's like on the, the cliff edge of a very scenic waterfall. And the ceremony apparently uh, consists of the entire city being present on the side of the waterfall, like on the, the cliff edge precipices going up all the way up. And it's just, it's ridiculous. And it the uh, CG was really bad during this scene, uh, seeing all the uh, the random extras on the side of this cliff edge waterfall. Like, how did they get up there? How did they get up on the side of that cliff? And they're all in, like, traditional African dress. I mean, they must have really messed up their, their gowns and, and suits going up that waterfall. It was just ridiculous. And... Uh, what kills me is um, one of the tribal leaders, there's four tribal leaders um, that take place in this uh, ceremony, and one of them has a massive lip disc, <laughs> which I do understand that they're trying to kind of support African traditionalism, but it's still, it's again, a very odd thing to see in this technological utopia. It's this there's this disconnect where they're all like embracing African traditionalism, but at the same time, there's this huge technological leap, uh, maybe even hundreds of years ahead of ours. And it's just a really odd thing to see. And I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. It's just, I couldn't get over it. This one guy with a massive, massive lip disc. I don't think another character in this film had a lip disc. And I guess this guy was making up for it because he had a lip disc that was big enough for everybody. Like, this guy is crazy. But anyway, so the ceremony on the side of the waterfall is basically a means for T'Challa to become king. And the way it works is the next in line has to stand before the other tribes and allow himself to be challenged for succession, is basically how it works. And if nobody comes forward with a challenge, he just becomes king. But of course, there is one tribe the black sheep tribe that lives in the mountains that has nothing to do with them that decides to come down on this special occasion and challenge them because they just hate Wakandans so much. And of course there's a big fight scene and of course T'Challa wins the fight 
but he doesn't just win the fight. He has to spare his opponent in a very noble and honourable way so that it gives his opponent leeway to help him again later in the future, which of course he does. Big spoilers. It's very typical, it's very cliche, and it's not very surprising. The whole sequence of events is basically a rehash of stuff you've seen time and time and time again. And the whole movie from this point on is basically stuff you've seen time and time and time again. So now T'Challa's is king and he wants to cement his rule by doing an impossible task. Something that his father could never do. He wants to track down a notorious mercenary that's been into Wakanda and has been making off with vibranium for years and years and years. Um, he's been a giant thorn in their ass. So he wants to put an end to it. And it's uh, none too subtly foreshadowed that his general has a big hate on for uh, Claw, the evil mercenary. And you pretty much know that something's going to become of this. Like they make such a big deal about you know, him going off to bring back Claw, and you know it's not going to go well. You know something's going to go wrong. And of course it does. Uh, they find out that Claw is uh, trying to sell a piece of uh, vibranium that he's plundered from uh, the Museum of Great Britain in London, which uh, that gave me a bit of a chuckle, so thanks for that. Uh, so then they go to China, I think it's China, although it could have been just a China town. <laughs> they go to a back they go to the back street of a China town, like a back alley, and there's a secret hidden entrance to a uh high stakes casino uh that's full of red velour velvet and you know like croupier tables and it's very James Bond, and I think that's probably what they were going with it because uh, T'Challa's sister is basically Q, who invents tons of technological gadgets and gizmos for him to, you know, play with. So there's that. And then the film unapologetically just turns into a James Bond film for about the next 20 minutes where you've got T'Challa and his two henchmen, like femme fatale followers... Uh, roaming the casino floors and talking into their little microphones and staking out the casino, waiting for Claw to turn up. They bump into a CIA agent who's also looking for Claw. They know about the deal. And it just turns into this, this spy thriller for about five minutes while they're inside this casino, uh, waiting for Claw to turn up. And before I forget to mention, how could I forget to mention that uh, Claw is played rather amazingly over the top by Andy Serkis. He's probably one of the best parts of this movie is just watching Andy Serkis just go crazy with this film. He's just all over the place. He's like a maniac in this film. So fun to watch, just chew everything. If he could climb onto the ceiling he would chew through the ceiling that's how much he's into this role it's amazing and of course eventually claw does turn up and all hell breaks loose pretty much immediately they discard the spy thriller thing almost immediately they just throw their walkie talkies aside and just start whipping out their staffs and just like going crazy in this casino to the point where claw is just like screw everything and just leaves just he doesn't care about the deal anymore i think he tries to grab the diamonds which uh, the deal is for, I mean, how cliche is that? They're trading vibranium for diamonds. But they leave the, um, they leave the casino. They've got, these, he's got a giant, like, entourage of vehicles just waiting for him. And they just hit the road. T'Challa and his bodyguards, his henchmen, are right behind him. The CIA agent is right behind them. And they all just, they get into their cars and then zoom off after them and then it just devolves into a chase scene for about the next 10 minutes. They're having this crazy chase scene through, God, I don't even know where they are. And I will give this chase scene credit, it is a lot of fun to watch, especially watching Black Panther kind of jump off of buildings and then back onto cars and then, you know, kind of flipping around the city while they're having this crazy chase scene. It is fun to watch, um, but sadly... 
From this point on, the movie just takes a nosedive and just falls apart completely. Um, not long after the chase scene ends, uh, Black Panther eventually does catch up to Claw, uh, and they now have him in custody. And the CIA agent, who is right behind them the whole time, takes him to a holding spot, somewhere they can interrogate him and question him, find out where he's been getting this vibranium. And all while this is going on, T'Challa's basically trying to negotiate Claw's release into his custody so that they can take him back to Wakanda. And this is the moment, this is the scene where the entire film, the entire movie, and everything that's been building up to this point completely just collapses and falls in on itself and makes completely no sense. Because in this scene, Claw is rescued by his henchmen. And the leader of the henchmen is a man called Eric, who you later discover is T'Challa's cousin. Um, his uncle came to America to try to help uh, the black community in controversial ways that weren't acceptable to Wakandans at the time. And the previous king gets wind of it, goes to America, kills his uncle, and leaves his cousin in America basically orphaned. And you find this out through flashbacks, through backstory, and Eric is basically using Claw as a means to get back into Wakanda because he's so grief-stricken over his uncle's death. He wants revenge, he wants to go to Wakanda, and because he's of royal, you know, blood, he can go to Wakanda and basically challenge the current king, T'Challa in this case, for the right to rule. And this is Eric's entire plan. The plan he's been building up all his life, trained for all his life, this is the linchpin to his entire plan, is using Claw to um, somehow gain access to Wakanda. And this is where the whole thing makes no sense because Eric is a complete outsider. He doesn't know anything about Wakanda, their traditions, their culture, and he is an absolute total maniac. So for this story to make sense, for this plot to make sense, they need a very convenient excuse for him to be in the position to usurp power in the first place, because otherwise they would have none of it. Like the council, the other tribes would have none of it. So the most nonsensical contrived excuse is manufactured in order for any of this to make sense. And that is uh, T'Challa's general or one of T'Challa's generals or best friend or someone that sits on his council named Wakabi, I think just happens to have a major hate on for Claw because I think he murdered someone who he was close to, like a family member or something, and he wants revenge. So the entire reason that uh, T'Challa goes after Claw in the first place is basically to appease Wakabi, to try and do something that his father never was able to do, bring Claw back to face justice for his friend. And Wakabi was completely convinced that T'Challa would be able to pull this off because he's more of a warrior. He's someone that will take action. And during the rescue of Claw from the CIA holding spot, Eric is leading the mercenaries. He has a mask on, but T'Challa knows it's Eric because he has the same ring that his father gave to him around his neck. So he knows that Eric was involved in the rescue of Claw, okay? So when Eric backstabs Claw after the rescue attempt in order for him to gain access to Wakanda, T'Challa's already back in Wakanda and had to explain to Wakabi that he'd failed. 
And of course, Wakabi's pissed off with him because he didn't do the thing he promised he would do. Thinks that everything is going to be the same as before, that he's no different from his father. And then, lo and behold, Eric shows up as the saviour of the day with Claw's corpse as a gift. And then challenges T'Challa to a duel. And of course, of course, of course, Wakabi is all for this and has absolutely no problems with it. Even though we've already established that T'Challa knows that Eric was the one to rescue Claw in the first place. So if Eric had not have intervened, then T'Challa would have been able to bring Claw back to Wakanda. And he doesn't bring this up. It's never brought up. It's a huge glaring plot hole that completely destroys so many points of this movie there's so many things in this movie that are influenced by this one event that could have so been easily just dismissed immediately had any common sense been used it's so frustrating to watch this movie from this point on because there's no way any of this makes sense if you think about it for a second The whole reason this challenge is allowed to go forward in the first place is because the council believe that it's in their best interest to have someone that uh, can accomplish things as the king because they feel like T'Challa's failed them when really Eric had basically screwed over everyone and it's known. It's not even like that this was subtle. It's so obvious and it's just so stupid. And now, of course, again, we have to have another duel on top of that waterfall because that's the ceremonial dueling place. And you know exactly what's coming. They, they basically pull a Rocky, a Rocky three, where T'Challa loses and Eric becomes the new king. And, you know, they, they do the false death where you think T'Challa's dead, but of course you know he's not. Of course you know exactly where this is going. Like, from this point on, you may as well just fall asleep or not even pay attention because you know exactly how this movie's going to end. Uh, you know for a fact how this movie's going to end because anyone that's anyone that's interested in these Marvel movies has seen the trailer for Infinity War in which you see T'Challa is still king. So, spoilers, I guess. But it's not even like it matters. Like, you would know that he's going to be king again. He's go- they're basically going to go back to status quo. Everything's going to be fine again. It's the same movie you've seen countless, countless times. Rocky Three specifically. Like, he has to lose the duel, but not just lose the duel. He has to lose in the most spectacular way possible. He has to get his ass thoroughly, thoroughly kicked in order to emphasise, to show off how much of a threat Eric is, I guess. So that when T'Challa inevitably wins later on, it can prove that he's grown or learnt something, when really, he doesn't learn anything. The stakes were already high when he was dueling Eric in the first place. I mean, the the stakes aren't any lower. The stakes are just as high at the end of the film as they were at the middle part where he's dueling him. So what's like, what has he learned? He's learned nothing. He's learned absolutely nothing from any of this. And he really shouldn't even be able to win the duel at the end because he hasn't learned anything. He hasn't done anything new. He doesn't have anything new other than the fact that maybe he knows how to use the Black Panther powers more effectively than Eric because he's used to them. I mean, that's literally all I can think of as to why he wins in the end, other than, of course, the plot contrivance, which I'll get to later. But now, Eric is king, and his reign of terror now begins, and even though the Wakandans and the council are hesitant towards it, kind of towards the beginning, it doesn't stop them, and everything that Eric is wanting to do goes against everything that the Wakandans have been built up to, up to this point. So he wants to use the advanced weapons and technology of the Wakandans and supply like black communities all over the world with weapons in order to rise up against white people or people that he believes is oppressing blacks or the black communities. And this is basically his entire plan. This is basically why he becomes king in the first place is to provide weapons and technology to the black communities in America I think 
I think he said like Shanghai, China, and it's just ridiculous. And I think it is kind of insulting to blacks and the black communities, really, if you think about it. I mean, it kind of gives the black community this broad brushstroke. Like, they're all, like, these vengeance-stricken people that want to rise up and murder thousands and thousands of people. It's just... It's so crazy. And I maybe that's the point. Like, they're trying to get across the, the fact that Eric is just a maniac, but it seems like his plan is going to work. Like, it, it seems like... Like, everyone's terrified that this is going to come to pass. Like, this this craziness is going to happen. And I suppose you could argue that the weapons could be misused for other purposes. But still, it's just insane to think about. And apparently, I'm not the only one. Because one of T'Challa's generals, who is grief-stricken over the apparent death of T'Challa, is basically just completely against this whole plan. And is the only one that is outspoken to this plan. Um, even her husband, who turns out to be Wakabi, is completely for it. Like, he's completely embraced the new rule of Eric Killmonger, which they have to <laughs> they have to shoehorn that in a few times. Killmonger, really? For Christ's sake, did they really have to include that? I mean, I think there are certain things you just leave out of comic book film adaptations, and that's one of them, because if you start adding things like Killmonger, it just makes the whole thing ludicrous. Like, am I supposed to take this guy seriously when people are running around calling him Killmonger? Ah, oh, Jesus. Anyway, so the general woman whose name escapes me, is her plan is basically to get one of the heart-shaped herbs that gives the Black Panther powers to the king, steal it away, and take it to the the tribe that lives in the mountains, the tribe that came earlier to challenge for the rule of King of Wakanda. Because they're the only ones that aren't influenced by Eric, and they're the only ones they think can help them now in their time of need. So they steal off into the night, with the CIA agent, because he is there too, which I forgot to mention, but eh. They steal one of the herbs and take it to the mountains. And of course, of course, of course, T'Challa is there. T'Challa has been rescued. He's been fished up by this tribe. And even though the king of this tribe could have accepted the heart-shaped herb, he feels like he owes T'Challa because he spared him in the duel. So, of course, it all comes full circle, like you know it would. He's there for him. He shows them to where he's kept T'Challa alive. They give him the heart-shaped herb to restore his powers. T'Challa wakes up, and now he's more badass than ever, apparently. But now, they also need an army so that they can invade Wakanda and usurp power back from Eric. So they go to the king of the mountains to ask for his army, but he refuses. But of course, again, you know exactly what's coming. He refuses, but you know, you know that later on, when all hope seems lost, the pivotal moment when everything is against the heroes, he shows up just at the right moment to save everyone. It's so stupid and such a cliche and the battle itself when he has to turn up in the first place is again rendered completely pointless because just before, you know, Eric's getting ready to send off all these weapons to all these countries and the female members of the tribe, the, the warriors of the tribe are completely against it. And they rebel against Eric. But the male warriors led by Wakabi are following Wakabi's orders. And he says that this mission's a go. So the female warriors are fighting against the male warriors. And of course killing each other. Wakandans killing each other in this stupid confrontation. Like all over Eric and his stupid crazed rule. Really? Are you really willing to go to all this effort? And all this sacrifice for this? For someone you don't even know? Apparently they are. And apparently they're willing to kill each other. But then at the end, Wakabi is facing off against 
his wife and just gives up. It's absolutely unbelievable. He went to these lengths willing to sacrifice probably hundreds of his own people over nothing apparently. Like these character motivations make absolutely no sense at all. And you're just supposed to take them at face value because without them, there wouldn't be a plot. Without them, you wouldn't have Eric in Wakanda in the first place. You wouldn't have him being able to take control in the first place because no one would be backing him. So they needed Wakabi to basically be this irredeemable nonsense villain that is just a villain for the sake of moving the plot forwards. It's so stupid. And again, the end fight where Eric is fighting against T'Challa, um, they previously set up that their advanced trains give off magnetic waves that disrupts vibranium. And this turns off the vibranium suits that Eric and T'Challa are wearing at the end of the movie. So there has to be a contrived way to get them onto these train tracks so that there's some kind of foreshadowed way that T'Challa can beat Eric. And the only way he can beat Eric is by cheating, apparently. So they have their duel, T'Challa comes out on top and beats Eric, but Eric is dying. So there's this emotional scene where you're supposed to feel sympathy for this maniac, uh, where he says that one of his life's dreams was to be able to see Wakanda because it's so beautiful and he never got a chance or something, some crap like that. So T'Challa picks him up and takes him to the edge of a vista where they can overlook Wakanda together and of course there's a glorious sunset and they can overlook the beautiful vista that is Wakanda and Eric is completely awestruck by this magnificent vista about how beautiful it is and T'Challa in a crazed moment of sympathy decides that maybe they might be able to save him and he offers this choice to Eric but He wants the last laugh, so instead decides to kill himself because he would rather die free than live as a slave or live to be incarcerated, which is ridiculous. It's supposed to be this like big grand moment where they try to push this message of freedom and racial pride, but it just doesn't work. It comes off as hollow because... The ideals that Eric was pushing, the idea of revolution and freedom for, like, blacks oppressed in America and other countries, is completely worthless because T'Challa has always been on the fence about providing more aid to the other parts of the world because of their technology and because of the impact that their society could have on the rest of the world. He's always been on the fence pretty much throughout the entire movie. He's never been withdrawn or so withdrawn that he is completely against it. So when Eric kills himself as this big grand gesture, I don't believe for one second that this was the turning point for T'Challa because he's always been in favour of giving more aid in the first place. And at the end of the movie, that's exactly what he does. So everything that was built up in this movie is completely worthless because had Eric not done anything, the outcome would have been exactly the same. Like he would have still revealed Wakanda to the rest of the world. He was just about to do it pretty much before Eric even turned up. So everything that Eric was striving for with his crazed lunacy was going to be accomplished one way or another. So the whole film just feels like a complete waste. And the overall message of the movie just seems confused. It almost seems like they were embarrassed. Like they didn't want to go down this route. Like they didn't really want to broach this particular political kind of branch. Because they don't really talk about it too much. Like Eric brings up the fact that... uh, to T'Challa in the throne room that you should be helping your people and T'Challa's like well we do help our own people we help Wakandans and Eric is like well 
what about all the other black people in the rest of the world? Weren't they born here in Africa? So you should be helping them just as much as you're helping Wakandans. And he basically dismisses it by saying that we don't interfere in other countries' politics. We only deal with our own. And Eric's just like, well, that's not good enough. But the thing that kills me is that T'Challa doesn't disagree with it. He just dismisses it. Like, they, it's def- it definitely seems like they wanted to portray Eric as this crazy idealist that had the extremist method or had the extremist viewpoint. And T'Challa was supposed to be the counterpoint, the guy that was advocating for a more balanced and neutral viewpoint and advocating for more equality, but among everybody and not just Wakandans. That was where he was coming from, but they don't really go into it too deeply. They get across that that's Eric's motivation, but nobody dismisses it. No one calls him out on it. No one regards it as evil or hateful. They just kind of roll with it. And it's not until the very, very end of the movie, post credits, where they actually, you know, stand up and say that there's more that connects us than divides us. I thought that was a really powerful message. One that speaks of humanity instead of these racial divides that occupies most of the movie. The most powerful message is left to the literal last minute of the movie and I think that's a real shame this message could have been pumped into this movie like crazy and it would have been a really good message but it seems like they really wanted to avoid labeling this particular message of revolution and racial pride and racial segregation as evil or hateful And I'm not 100% clued up on the politics of America. And this film does seem to draw more from the politics of America. But it really does seem like they wanted to steer clear of labelling this kind of, well at least in my opinion, very extremist viewpoint. Because this is, as far as I've seen, a fairly popular opinion in America. I'm not sure how common it is among the general public but it does seem to be a fairly popular belief. Quite a few powerful people have this belief. And I don't think they wanted to ruffle these feathers because, again, it is very political. And in the end, it's just a shame. It just comes across as half-hearted. Like, they had this message, but they didn't really want to push it, which is a shame. And I'm guessing I am the minority opinion on this, but... That's just what I think. That's how it came across to me. I'm sure that some people will disagree. And I have seen, you know, a few articles basically praising the hell out of Black Panther for the message that it was apparently trying to convey. But as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't pushed far enough. If that's the message they wanted to put across, then they should have gone all the way. Without the fear of political reprisals or public outcry or whatever. And the same goes for the reviewers of this movie. And I can't help but think the same thing got in the way when they were reviewing this movie. I mean, grow some balls, guys. At the end of the day, messages aside, politics aside, it's an average movie. It's a good movie that has a severe plot hole that undermines pretty much half of the plot like the majority of the plot, and it's just fine. It's fun, but it does not deserve the praise it's getting. Put aside your political agendas, grow some balls, review the movie for what it is, not for the message or what you think the message is, and just Jesus Christ. It's so embarrassing, like facepalm embarrassing. When I'm scrolling through news sites, scrolling through reviews, seeing Black Panther getting perfect scores because of some make-believe political agenda. It's just stupid. Just stop, okay? Because you're just embarrassing yourselves at this point. (sighs) But yeah, that's what I thought of it. A good movie, but just good. Not great, not bad, just okay. A good Marvel movie, if you can get over the politics. (laughs) 